we are very, very excited to have really the other side of the coin attend us, attend with us today. Um, this is the Zillow team. And there are some really unique things about the Zillow Prize. Um, the first is it was a 20-month long competition that was broken up into two different, um, really separate competitions. And you had to perform really well in the first one to even get invited to the second. Um, so you know, there was just a lot of really amazing things about that competition in particular. And uh, we wanted to share with you um, some insights from the competition host. So Anthony, take it over. All right, very good. Thanks, Maggie. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off. I'm going to ask the uh, the first set of questions, but then the plan is to open it up to the audience. So as you know, if there's anything you want to dig into, uh, start thinking about it, and we'll we'll turn it over to you. Um, so Jazz, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you don't know this, but um, I got uh, I was on the way to uh, 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 you know heading out to go kite surfing in early uh, uh, April uh, 2016, and I got this email from Jazz at Zillow. It's like we want to write a prize with you. Um, and uh, for us, this is very exciting. You know, every, house prices are something that everyone can relate to. And uh, uh, certainly from the minute it came in, we knew this had the potential to be absolutely huge. I um, was interested in hearing a little bit about, you know, where the idea came from, why Zillow wanted to, you know, wh what made you uh, reach out? What made you think that a machine learning competition might be a good thing for those estimates? Great. I'm, I'm glad you were excited about that email. Um, before I answer that question, I wanted to ask the audience how many of you were in the competition? Just out of curiosity? OK. Great. OK, cool. Great. Um, so you know, we've, we've had the idea of, we've always thought about doing the competition for many years, really, uh, ever since Netflix Prize, which was an inspiration to do this, uh, uh, this competition, Zillow Prize, we've been thinking about it. And we just never felt the time was right until a couple of years ago. And the reason for that is we, you know, when we, this estimate was launched, uh, we had estimates on 40 million homes, and, and the error was approximately, median absolute percent error was around 14%. And we felt there's a lot of room to improve that with our in-house team, and uh, Andy uh, is a part of that team. And, um, and we made a lot of progress. We got to the point where the median error got closer to 4%, and we were at, had estimates on 100 million homes. And, we're at a point as that we need to try, it was much harder to move the needle. We needed to try uh, a lot more ideas, but we couldn't get the, the scale uh, that we needed with that internal team. So I, I actually, I don't know if Anthony rem remembers, I actually met him before that email. We had a conversation. It was a quick conversation. Uh, he at a conference in San Francisco. I forget which one. But um, so we chatted a little bit, and then we had some discussion internally. We said this is the right time to do the competition, and um, it's been a fantastic partnership with the Kaggle team. And um, uh, so that, that's that's the start of the start of the idea. Cool. Thank you, and from our perspective as well, um, Andy. Of course, uh, setting up the prize was simple, right? It, what, there wasn't much you had to do <laughs> to. Uh, uh, I, I wish it was simple, and I actually think. As a competition host, you you should really think about setting up a competition a lot. And I certainly did. And I know that my team at Zillow and Jazz, we we spent a long time working with Kaggle, like folks like Wendy uh, and Anthony, talking about how to do the competition, how to design the right metric, how to pick the right metric. Yeah. The data itself is a big, complicated thing. We for each round, we had this data plan um, that we had that I was putting together uh, with with my team and. It would start by you know, going through our production pipeline and saying, all right, what data are we using? All right, but what data are we not maybe using, but we should definitely, we've always been interested in, like, you know, maybe there's signal there we just haven't found. So first we just cataloged a bunch of stuff. But then it turns out we had to go talk to the lawyers mm -hmm. because our lawyers were like, well, actually, you can't share this, you can share this, that. Uh, and, and this actually, we actually, when we talked to the Netflix folks about how they ran their competition, uh, something we learned that I don't think is really well known is that they were not able to share their full data set uh, as well. And so we sort of took our cues from them and said, all right, well, we will share maximally everything we can, which is mostly data that comes from public assessor's offices, you know, um, you know, loan data, things like that. Um, it's out in the public sphere, and that is really important for predicting home prices. So we come up with this data plan, and then we need to pick a region because, you know, uh, we can't just throw 
all the data for 110 million homes at, at Kagler's. I mean, we could, but I think you would just drown in the data. It, it requires a pretty extensive production pipeline system that's very complicated to just sort of do all the computation distributed. And so we thought that that really wasn't great. Uh, and so we started narrowing it down. We wanted to find a region that we thought had interesting homes and like people would know it. And so New York is kind of a mess. It's a big city, but okay, maybe, well, Los Angeles is great. And we thought we had a really interesting problem set there. So we picked the data for Los Angeles. We said, let's get all the public data together. You know, we had to modify some of the scripts that, create, that sort of we use data to do data cleaning with, uh, sort of get things into like a tighter, you know, sort of more singular monolithic data set because one of, you know, my mottos for designing the data for the competitions is that you all should be able to go from zero to modeling in 30, you know, minutes or less. Like, I don't want you to have to be fussing with the data unless you think there's a signal to, be, to go out there or you want to clean it a little more. But I don't think that's where you have to start. I think that's, you know, I think it's kind of fun to build a benchmark model really quickly and then to have ideas. And then, obviously, round two has a larger data set. And there we threw, you know, like 10 years of, of data at folks. And so, uh, the other thing that's unique about this competition and I think made the data set up and the execution a little more uh, certainly like kept us on our toes is that we were doing future predictions. So we needed to give Kagglers data updates to, keep the, to give them the freshest data you could possibly get to make your future predictions with. Uh, and I was really happy with the future prediction framework. Uh, but it definitely meant that we were uploading data and you know, working with Wendy to like, make sure that there weren't any leaks and cleaning the data and trying to make sure that everything was consistent, you know, always up to these deadlines. So it was, there's a lot of logistical work. There was a, a guy on my team uh, who can't be here today, Ben He, who did just a ton of really hard work, pretty much worked on it full time to put the data together for a couple of years. Um, you um, mentioned briefly uh, that one of the decisions you had to make was on the metric. Can you talk about um, um, some of the traits, you know, some of the things you were thinking about as you were selecting a metric? Yeah, so, and actually I think this is where uh, I benefit a lot from having, from Carlos actually showing the, uh, the distribution of home prices in the Sperber Bank competition just earlier before lunch. So you saw just how, uh, how much skew there is, how long a tail there is. So. Uh, metrics like root mean squared error, for example, are going to have outliers dominate the metric. And I, I think, at least for me, and I think I wanted to, we, I was thinking a lot about a metric that would sort of motivate people to make improvements that we would see across a lot of homes in the data set and not just end up focusing on, you know, a very small subset of homes with large errors potentially. But at the same time, there, there are other metrics where you know, you maybe wouldn't move the tails at all. And, and we were interested in trying to maximize uh, what we could get out of it. So uh, one, we, we went with these log metrics uh, in part because it, you know, then you can stabilize this distribution and it looks much more Gaussian and if you take a log or work in a ratio space. Uh, and also, uh, we, want, we, we used sort of a Windsorized or, or truncated error distribution. We said, all right, if we're 40% if we're off, it's probably in the data that's generating this. Like, like, those are outliers. We really want folks to focus on the stuff that we think can be predicted with some improvements, with clever feature engineering and better models. And, uh, you also used a clever, um, you had, in releasing data publicly, you had some data privacy issues uh, uh, that had to be overcome, right? And so the step you took on step one, the, the metric you used or the way, what people were predicting in step one, stage one was pretty interesting. Yeah, in stage one, uh, we, we actually took our cues from uh, another really uh, uh, great competition host, I think, uh, Two Sigma, who sort of turned on the lights for us about, you know, you can, you can build metrics off of, or you can make metrics off the residuals, right? So, and, and instead minimize the residual error, and, you know, uh, in this case of this estimate. So, in this case, uh, we have this estimate, so if we combine that with the predictions coming from the, the different solutions that Kegler's were putting in, we can actually then directly add them together and reduce the error. Uh, it's sort of like another boosting step. Uh, and, and so uh, that way we were able to, you know, use estimates sort of without having to necessarily like put a bunch of estimates out um, and, or, or like share the estimate generating algorithm like super widely because that's our secret sauce. 
Mm. And, it's, and, and it's a very, uh, so it, to the extent that people find any signal, they're basically finding things that the Zestimant didn't find, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then w one more aspect of the competition that's worth um, us talking a bit about is, as you said, the future prediction uh, is challenging and there's an extra layer of challenge, which is the data is somewhat public eventually, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did, you, how, did you, how did you navigate that? Well, I think that's, that was really one of the, the early design challenges was, okay, uh, home sales data is eventually made public by various counties across the United States. And we know Keglers are very bright and very competitive. And so if we were to use sort of a, a traditional sort of, you know, holdout set on data from a couple years ago, I think one of, the, one of the smartest and easiest ways to win that competition would be to go pull the public data from the holdout set. Figure out what, what we'd held out and go find it, go find the sale prices directly. Uh, and so that's, that's a good, clever way to win. And I think uh, it's an example of all the sorts of ways that there can be leakage, right, between the, the holdout set and the private leaderboard and, the public, and what's in the public leaderboard. Uh, and, and so we really figured out, well, one, you know, from a very, from this other practical standpoint, when people come to Zillow and, and they actually, you know, go and look up the details on a home, they see his estimate, they're interested in sort of a, a now cast or a near future prediction. And that's, that's really the problem we're trying to solve for people. So doing this future prediction framework really has two benefits. It actually brought the competition a little closer to solving the problem uh, in the same framework that Zillow faces. It also really changes, it like reduces the amount of possible leakage between, you know, the public and the private uh, sets, evaluation set, pretty much to zero as far as I can tell. So I, I could sleep a lot easier knowing that, like, there wasn't going to be, uh, you know, like a, a, a hack that, you know, where I'd done something silly with the data set and then, uh, you know, like, it's going to turn out that, like, all the even rows are, like, you know, condos. <laughs> Andy, maybe you can talk about the over the horizon, just to expand on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So future prediction, the other way we talk about it is over the horizon, uh, right? So, so folks, the other, thing, the other thing that made that unusual is that folks needed to predict, for example, what, what a home might sell for in, L, in Los Angeles for all 3 million plus homes in the greater Los Angeles area that were in the competition, because we don't know what's going to sell either. Uh, and, and so you just end up having these much larger submission files. They're, they're nowhere as large as these big GAN submission files of images that Wendy was talking about, but they, it's definitely a lot bigger. Uh, so, so you mentioned uh, you like the, the, you know, the, the, the format um, where you're predicting the future because you could sleep at night, but I am curious, were you nervous? You know, we're pushing run the, the night before. Did you sleep well uh, before the competition went out? Uh, I didn't sleep that well, but it was, it was more because I was, it was more about, okay, well, have we gotten all the data in the right format? Was there something silly there? I mean, is the text on the competition website right? Have we got everything? I mean, there's a lot to do uh, as a host in working with Kaggle to put a good competition website together and to make it good for you guys, you know, uh, and to make, to try to clarify anything about the rules or the data, there's always a lot of questions, so. Um. One of the magical things, and I think that the, the the things that made the Zillow Prize a particularly engaging competition is how active you were in the forums. Uh, and so I was curious, like, what were you doing? At, what was, what did your days look like uh, during the prize? Um, you know, we, how 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 much were you following along? Well, especially in the beginning on round one, because there was four thousand plus people around around four thousand Kaglers in in that round. So. The first few weeks, I think my day would start, I, I would often wake up and on my phone, just sort of check, because I can, I've subscribed to the forum, so to check to see like, what are the new posts, are there any, has anybody replied to something I put on, you know, go, go get on the computer if it's a Saturday morning and, you know, and, and read posts, read questions to me, think about responses, sometimes take a little bit of time to sort of let it roll around my head and before I wrote up an answer. Uh, and then usually there's at least one more time where I would check in in the evening before I went to sleep. And that was probably the first two weeks, and then, you know, sort of continue to, to keep on. And then, you know, it, w it was great because sometimes there would be a question I would see for Wendy, so I'd pass her a little email saying, "Hey, there's a question." And sometimes, the, uh, you know, uh, she would pass me a note saying, "Hey, there's something that maybe you think you should answer." What What were the nature of the um, the, the What was the nature of the discourse? Uh, uh, was it complaints? Was it um, uh, kind of questions? Was it um, insights that you found useful? 
Well, when it comes to questions that I was fielding, there were often questions about the rules, or sort of, there were definitely some questions about sort of, well, why, are you, why did you present things in a particular way? I know I got a few questions about the, about the metric itself, and, and so, you know, sort of found some papers to sort of talk about unbiased metrics for you know, proportional data and things like that. Uh, but I think there's just a lot of questions about the rules. There were more, the rules were, there, was a, there were some more complicated rules, and, you know, there's a, questions about the data set, and what things mean sometimes, uh, I also feel, feel like I ended up fielding. Uh, I also enjoyed lurking on a lot of the other forum threads. There's just so much interesting stuff that people are doing and looking at kernels and seeing what they were outputting. Is there anything, any kernels or any discussion threads in particular that you, you thought were like aha moments for you or you know, big leaps forward in, in learning for you? Uh, now you're gonna be really think back to like two years ago. <laughs> Uh, I think there were some really great visualizations in kernels. There were stuff that I, I basically was stolen. <laughs> I'm just like, this is great. Uh, I really, I think there was some, a lot of like map, uh, like map plotting libraries that I saw uh, in kernels that I was like, oh, this is great. We should totally be using this. Um, okay, so uh, we had the, the competition had a, an unusual format. So the, as you said, 4,000 or so teams uh, in round one and then, uh, and then uh, the, the top performers from round one qualified for uh, round two. Can you talk through the, the logic behind the round one, round two structure? You want to take that? Yeah, I can, I can do, you, the, you've been doing a great job. Um, so uh, th that's a good question. It is, it's un, I think it's an unusual format. And I think from guidance from, from Anthony, uh, we and, and, and our own internal opinions, we felt the competition would be popular. And, would have a lot of teams, and it did have a lot of teams. We had 4,000 plus teams, I think one of the uh, more popular competitions on Kaggle. And just managing all of, the, all of the submissions, managing all of that, we felt that it'd be better to break it down into two rounds, where the first round is um, a smaller data set, uh, less work to do to um, uh, manage all of that, and then, um, and then round two, we'll take the top, the, the, the top folks from round, the, most of the top folks from round one, and then we'll give a larger data set, and we can, it's just easier to manage and, 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 and uh, verify all the solutions. So that was some other things, but that's uh, uh, overall the thinking there. Um, so c coming to the results, um, one of the criteria for being able to win the prize was you had to uh, pass the, 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 the current estimate score uh, and, uh, and, and the winners w were successful. I'm curious, were you uh, going into this, you know, were you expecting uh, this estimate to be passed? Did, were you skeptical it was gonna be passed? Were you uncertain? What was your thinking? I'd say it was one of the big unknowns. I had from just sort of lurking on other competitions, I expected that, some, that it was likely that a team would pass us but if you had to make me bet beyond direction, I, I don't think I could have guessed the magnitude with any, any precision at all. I, just to add on to, I think Anthony kept telling us, you'll de 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 definitely beat it, so <laughs> he, he, uh, and he was right. And, um, and also, I think the, the competition is different than our, the data we provide in the competition is different than what we have in production because of what Andy talked about earlier, that legal restrictions around MLS data and broker data, so we could only share the public data. So we actually had to create a benchmark model just for the competition. Um, and um, so it was, it was hard to compare apples to apples. And, and so I, I, I assume the benchmark um, created for the competition is sort of um, based on this estimate, but somewhat stripped down because you're missing some data sources. Is that yeah. a good way to think about it? I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah, I think, and actually, again, I should call out my, my colleague, Ben He, who's not here. Uh, he, that's absolutely he, one of the things I told him, like, all right, go go make this new, completely new line of this estimate algorithm. It, it's close, it, it's pretty close. So any people who, yeah. you know, we're in round two, you should feel pretty good about what you did, because. Uh, but it is not quite the same because we, we definitely have to hold stuff back. Mm. And, and, and I think, you know, Anthony and I, we were talking about uh, even the image data, the listing images. We really wanted to put it out there and the unstructured data, but we just had legal restrictions. We couldn't just put that on the competition. And I do think, though, it, that we learned a lot uh, from the competition and, and, and some interesting ideas that will benefit the course estimate, and we're looking into that. 
And actually, what were, what, you know, it's a nice segue. What, what were some of the, curious to, to, to get a sense for some of the, some of the big learnings uh, out of the winning solution? Yeah, and I, I think, uh, and actually, uh, Anthony actually brought this quote to my attention from, from one of our winning teams. They said, well, we knew going in that the, mo that the three most important things for real estate were location, location, location. It turns out that like the 20 most important things are location uh, in this space. <laughs> Uh, and so, in many ways, I, was, I, was, I would say I was very surprised, like, I, just how much more signal there was, even in the data that we provided, that, that everyone here, you know, and the folks who aren't here just sort of cleverly figured out how to feature engineer it out, and that, that, was, that was really great. I actually, another really big surprise is just how important, like, I knew outliers were a problem, right? We designed the metric around that. Um, and, and, and Kagler's really, really showed that like really being much more aggressive in your outlier filtering is probably a really great idea for us as well. Um, that's, I don't know if that's necessarily a standard practice uh, in industry. Uh, there's, there's so many things to learn that we could, we could I just go on and on. Um, Do you want to talk about outlier filtering? So, um, you know, any particular techniques or um, um, th things that you saw that um, you want to take back? I, I think actually what was really funny is that people would build these very simple models, right? It, or look at, the, in the round one, look at this estimate area and be like, all right, well, if they were off 60%, I'm just going to throw it out. <laughs> and, and so like, we designed a metric to sort of minimize that, and people are like, you know what, we're not even going to just, we're not even going to take, we're, we're not even going to let it cap it out. We're just going to completely remove it. It's just noise. <laughs> uh, and so weren't even making predictions for the, uh, it, yeah. Well, they were, but they were never letting them into the training set, right? So they were just like, nope, there's just oh, nothing yeah. to learn. <laughs> What's yeah. it, and, and that's an interesting insight, right? Because uh, um, you would have thought that the, the intuition would be, oh, let's target their biggest errors because that's where the biggest opportunity for improvement is. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Um, at, so at the end of the competition, uh, the winners uh, deliver code, documentation, and a screen share presentation. I was curious, like of, the, uh, of those outputs, um, which ones do you find most useful? I can't imagine not having all three, actually. Uh, I, I think we were, in round two, we, did, we really asked that folks dockerize their solutions. And, and so we could actually not only have the code, but have code that's relatively easy to run. And that has been tremendously helpful for trying to understand what people do in detail. But without the, the documentation and, and really the great presentations and the, you know, something that happens when you win is uh, a category competition is that you get, you have to do a winner's call, which is usually, at least for us, has been about an hour long video conference. And, you know, I, I have, my team will, will pre-read and, and we'll come with questions. And the back and forth from there is always really helpful. And we always learn something from that as well. And that really gives us a higher level sort of, you know, view of the forest uh, for, you know, like what are the big things that moved the data and what were the things they found? And then really digging into the details in the code. Um, another, uh, sorry, we're talking about the round one, round two setup. Another difference with round two is that people could use external uh, data sets. Yeah. I was curious whether, um, did people bring uh, new data sets uh, in round two? Uh, and if not, what, you know, what prevented? Well, and that was, so we were really excited going into this to have a competition, I think Anthony was too, to have a competition where you could use external data. It's not, it was again another place where we sort of had departed from sort of the standard template potentially that a lot of uh, competitions are in. Uh, and I think about 40% of teams in round two did some kind of exploration that we could see documented with external data. Uh, but one thing we heard in the winner's calls, you know, like, like one, we were actually surprised that it wasn't like 80, 90% of teams. Uh, and, and something we heard in the winner's calls is actually that like linking to external data sets is actually quite difficult in this space. Particularly one of the things we heard is that geocoding is hard and very error prone. And it's actually something we see ourselves. Uh, and so I think there were, there's so many people, lots of ideas. With that. I think they were really frustrated in just being able to accurately link these outside data sets. Mm -hmm. Data joining is hard. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions uh, from the audience shortly. Um, but before I do, um, biggest surprise? I think the biggest surprise, oh God, there's so many. But OK, so some little ones. I we had no idea, because, because I admit I haven't done enough competitions to realize that 
our winning team has never, they've never been in a room with each other. And I think actually today, I imagine there's many folks here who are, who are meeting people they've partnered with in the past, uh, in the flesh the first time. Uh, I just, it's so different from sort of an industry collaboration model where you tend to be, you know, physically co-located. Uh, another real big surprise for me is the get, taking the insights from, from the winning solutions and then figuring out how to take them to production has been tricky. The, the reverse engineering effort is ongoing. I've got two, or three, two to three people at any given time back in Seattle working on going through these top solutions and testing things because we do have to test them, right? Like we, we, had, we held back some data, so we sort of need to revalidate these assumptions. And it turns out that like the particulars of the feature engineering and the particulars of the models go together really closely. You know, we have to do a lot more whole cloth re-implementation than just sort of grabbing this engineered feature and shoving it into the production's estimate. Uh, and so this is actually a lot of fun, it turns out, for, for me and my folks. Mm -hmm. Um, so a ra round of applause for Andy and Jazz. Uh, thank you very much.